When I think about what is happening demographically in the United States today, I am reminded of what happened in Haiti a little over 200 years ago. Haiti used to be the most prosperous part of the New World. It was the jewel of the Caribbean and the pride of France's colonial empire. Great mansions dotted the countryside, and the social life in Haiti's towns rivaled that in the cities of France. Then the democracy craze hit France, and the madness also infected many of the Frenchmen in Haiti. Liberty, equality, and brotherhood were to be applied even to the black plantation workers who had been brought to Haiti from Africa. That was the politically correct thing, and political correctness had deranged just enough of Haiti's French population so that the population as a whole was not able to put up any sort of solid front against the madness. They sat in their clubs, and their drawing rooms, and their libraries, and they sipped their wine, and they observed what was happening around them in Haiti as the blacks were declared equals and brothers. And they discussed the situation, but they couldn't quite bring themselves to do anything about it before the massacres started. And then it was too late. And so all of the Frenchmen and their women and their children were slaughtered some of them in ways too horrible to describe on this program. And the books from their libraries, and the paintings and tapestries and sculptures from their townhouses and their plantation manors became trinkets and baubles for the black plantation workers. And then the subhumans had Haiti all to themselves. And what had been the richest and most productive part of the New World promptly sank back to an African level of squalor, misery, and poverty. The roads and cities built by the French fell into ruin. A peculiarly African mixture of anarchy and despotism took the place of French law and order. A little over a century later, in 1915, following an especially chaotic and bloody period, U.S. Marines were sent into Haiti to force a semblance of order on the country. The reason for sending them was to safeguard American business interests in Haiti, although President Wilson told Americans that the Marines were being sent to bring democracy to Haiti. The Marines remained in Haiti for 19 years. They not only enforced governmental stability there, but they also built schools and hospitals, a modern telephone system, and more than a thousand miles of paved roads who really gave the Haitians the basis for a fresh start. As soon as the U.S. Marines pulled out in 1934, however, the Haitians returned to their own way of doing things, to indolence, corruption, and voodoo. Everything the Americans had built for them gradually returned to the jungle. In 1958, the United States sent the Marines to Haiti again, this time with the aim of rebuilding the country's economy and infrastructure so that it would not succumb to communist influences. Again, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars rebuilding what the Haitians had wrecked and training thousands of them in the skills needed to keep the country running. But when we pulled out again, the country immediately returned to its old ways, its African ways. And in 1994, we tried the same foolishness all over again, claiming that we were restoring democracy to Haiti. Why can't we accept the plain and simple truth that the Haitians are different from us, that they are Africans, not Europeans like us. They are Negroes and that left to themselves, they must do things in the way Negroes always have done them, with indolence, corruption, and voodoo. I have in front of me a book on Haiti written by a British scholar, Hesketh Pritchard, and the title of his book is Where Black Rules White, A Journey Across and About Haiti. 
Pritchard was sympathetic to the blacks and wanted to see how they lived when they had been introduced to civilization by whites, but were then left completely free to do as they wished, without white control. He writes of Haiti in the first chapter of his book, quote, There the law of the world is reversed and the black man rules. It is one of the few spots on earth where his color sets the Negro upon a pedestal and gives him privileges. The full-blooded African is paramount. Even the mulattoes and half-breeds are disliked and have been barbarously weeded out as time has passed." End of quote. Pritchard's book is filled with detailed descriptions of his personal experiences with various facets of Haitian life. He remarks on the good-natured, open-hearted character of the people, who could nevertheless commit the most blood-curdling atrocities at the least provocation. The official religion which they inherited from their former French masters is Roman Catholicism, but the true religion of the people is voodoo, a peculiarly African religion based on snake worship. In religion, as in other aspects of Haitian life, there is a bizarre blending of white forms with black substance. <laughs> what had dawned on Pritchard is that to the Haitians, the imitation of civilization is as good as the real thing. They believe that if they are able to dress like white men and speak the white man's language and mimic the white man's institutions, then they are as good as white men. And you know, what Pritchard observed of the Haitians applies equally well to blacks in the United States today. Pritchard ends his book with a chapter titled, Can the Negro Rule Himself? And he answers his question, and I quote, The Negro has had his chance. He has had the most beautiful and fertile of the Caribbeans for his own. He inherited a made country. Here was a wide land sown with prosperity, and in the midst of it, the black man was turned loose to work out his own salvation. At the end of a hundred years of trial, what progress has the black man made? Absolutely none. End of quote. That's the way it was a century ago, and that's essentially the way it is today. Despite three large-scale efforts by the United States during this century to improve the lot of the Haitians. Now, why is all of this important to us? A century ago, Pritchard was by no means an unusual man of his class. He went to Haiti, he carefully observed life there in great detail, and he drew logical conclusions from his observations. But it is unimaginable that a scholar today could make observations like Pritchard did and then publish his conclusions in a book by a mainstream publisher. One would be hard-pressed to find a scholar from any university today who would have the courage to write honestly about Haiti because he knows that if he did, he would be condemned as a racist and would be drummed out of the academy. That's how far downhill our civilization has slid in a century. The Haitians have their voodoo, with all of its disgusting and bizarre beliefs and practices. And we have our cult of political correctness. It is a cult based as much on superstition and as devoid of reason and logic as the voodoo of the Haitians and it exercises as strong a hold on its adherents. A Haitian would as soon offend a voodoo witch doctor and risk having a curse put on himself as one of our modern scholars would risk being labeled a racist. But I do believe that when the more rational elements of our population finally rise up and stamp out the cult of political correctness, the affair will be bloody than anything Haiti has seen in its blood-soaked history. And the sooner the better.